Um, so tonight I'm preaching on the doctrine of Christ, as well as some of the other doctrines that are, uh, that are outlined in Hebrews 6, which are con- considered to be the milk of the word, and their foundational doctrines as independent Baptists. Um, so in Hebrews 5.12, it says, For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. And I become such as have need of milk, and not of strong meat, for every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth them that are, to them that are full of age, even the, those who by use have used, uh, having their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So again, you have to use the gifts of God, you have to use the word uh, to be skillful in it. You know, so just reading the Bible, uh, it's not going to help you as much as if you're, u- if you're reading the Bible, but also using the Bible in your own life to teach others, also to preach the gospel. Um, so again, this is how you have your senses exercised, to, know, to discern both good and evil. So then in Hebrews 6.1 it says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of the laying on of hands, and of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. So the doctrine of Christ that we see in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, that's repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. So it says repentance from dead works. So you're rejecting your good works, and what are you doing? You're having your faith towards God. So you're believing on the Lord, which is consistent with every other scripture on salvation that you'll find in the Bible. You know, just John 3.16, whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So, and I wouldn't need to cover too much of this, because I've already gone through a lot of this in a couple of previous sermons on what repentance is in regard to salvation. Uh, But anyone who's read the Bible knows God repents more than anybody else in the Bible. So if you're meant to repent of your sins, then God would be a sinner. And the lie that repent means turn uh, from your sins, that's a doctrine of devils. And we reject that here as Baptists. And you, you absolutely find zero proof of repenting of your sins in the Scriptures. In fact, the words in that form, repent of your sins, don't even exist within the Scriptures. But you will find it in some perversions of the Scripture, but not in the King James Bible. So, and I, I just want to say also, in the entirety of the book of John, that word repent is used zero times. Um, And this is the book that claims to be written that you would believe on the Son of God and have life through His name. This is how to be saved. You know, so there's no confusion about the word repent. Repentance is required for salvation. We do not deny that. You know, you must repent and believe the gospel. But John, however, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, he taught that believing on the Lord is how you receive eternal life and how you receive the remission of sins. You know, so he chose not to use the word repent even though he teaches repentance from dead works and faith towards God. So God through it, you know, and he teaches that throughout the entire book of John. Um, and I believe that so we'd clearly understand and not be confused about repentance. You know, as many today teach a false repentance that's of works. You know, even Jonah 3.10, it's clear that turning from your sins is a work. So it can't be part of believing. You know, and repentance means that you're trusting that what, whatever you're trusting in, you must reject that and believe the gospel of Christ. And that's what repentance is. Turn from your false God to the one living God. Turn from your false belief in your own works to trusting in the works of Jesus Christ alone. You know, so all you could say, as it says in Hebrews 1, but Hebrews 6, 1, repentance from dead works and faith towards God. So Romans 4, we know we're justified by faith with our works, and I mean, I've already preached on this a couple of times. We'll just read through the first few verses again, starting in Romans chapter 4, verse 1. It says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For Abraham, if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof the glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and he was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. 
Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. And of course, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, we're also familiar with that. For by grace you are saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. So I already preached on this, so I'm not going to rehash it all. But we all know the clear teaching that the only way to be saved is to put all your faith on Jesus Christ. And that our works play absolutely no part in the process. You know, we're saved because we trust in his works, his death, his burial, his resurrection. So, of course, there's also John the Baptist. He taught the baptism of repentance. And this is another way where they misrepresent what repentance means. But the Bible actually spells out in black and white what the baptism of repentance is. So I'll get you to turn to Luke chapter 3. I'll just read to you from Mark chapter 1, verse 4. It says, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So keep that in mind. We're going to look at what remission of sins means. We'll look at that in just a moment. Again, this is something the Bible defines itself. So in Luke chapter 3, verse 3, it says, And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. And again, they saw the salvation of God in the flesh. That's Jesus Christ. You know, and this is the thing, like even Isaiah prophesied of Jesus Christ. The Old Testament prophets all knew uh, about the coming Messiah. So it wasn't a surprise when he came on the scene. And what John was teaching was exactly what the rest of the prophets were teaching, except he was just saying, hey, the, the next guy to come, that's the guy. That's the Messiah. And uh, in the book of Acts, turn to Acts chapter 10. It teaches exactly what it was that John preached. So this is Peter speaking. He said, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, sorry, verse, in verse 34, chapter 10 of Acts, said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word I say ye know which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To, give, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive the remission of sins. So how did they receive the Holy Ghost and how did they receive the remission of sins? Was it by baptism or was it by believing on the Lord? You know, so it's consistent with all scripture that it's when you believe you're saved and receive the Holy Ghost. You know, so baptism with water is just a picture of salvation. It's not salvation itself or play any part in salvation. You know, so we see exactly what John the Baptist was preaching. It's also consistent with what Christ was preaching and what Peter was preaching here and what every Old Testament prophet was preaching in their day from Abel to Zacharias. So back in Acts chapter 10, pick up in verse 44, it says, While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles was also poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these men should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost? as well as we, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So again, they believed, they received the Holy Ghost, and then they were baptized. 
You know, baptism has nothing to do with, uh, with salvation, with receiving the Holy Ghost, with receiving eternal life, with your sins being remitted. You know, it's just a picture of the gospel that they, they just believed. In Acts 19.4, it says, Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. So this is what John was saying when he's baptizing them for the baptism of repentance. It says, Saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. So it's crystal clear what John the Baptist was teaching. He was preaching, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and that shall be saved. That's exactly what we preach and that's exactly what the Old Testament prophets preached. Believe on the Lord and thou shalt be saved. Salvation's that easy. You know, and if you do that, your sins will be remitted. You know, they're forgiven and remembered no more. It's by believing, not by baptism or any other works. So the next doctrine that's mentioned in Hebrews 6 is the doctrine of baptisms. So we've just covered what the baptism of John was, and the term baptism just means immersed. Like, you know, so if you're immersed in something, it means you're like surrounded by something or, you know, just covered in something. It just means immersion. So we baptize in water and we immerse them in water. And in John 3.23 it says, And John also was baptizing in Anon near to Salem because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. So again, they needed a lot of water there because to be immersed, you have to dunk people. You have to be fully immersed in that. It has to be, you know, you can't just do it with a thimble of water and sprinkle somebody. It doesn't work that way. You know, it's about immersion. So Romans 6, um, we'll get to that in a second. I'll get you to turn there actually. Because Romans 6 is quite clear about what baptism is and what it actually represents. You know, so we're buried in the likeness of Christ and we're risen a new creature. You know, it's symbolic of the gospel, the death, burial and resurrection of the Lord. So in verse 3 of Romans chapter 6, it says, Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him, for in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead, indeed unto sin, but alive unto God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now this is just about talking about how the old man, we need to put off the old man and walk after the new creature, the new man. You know, we need to walk in the spirit to not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's what he's speaking about here. And that's what baptism represents, that we die with Christ in the flesh, but the new man, the new creature, is made alive. Because uh, not through baptism, but through uh, believing on the Lord. So we've covered how the baptism of repentance is for the remission of sins. And your sins are remitted that moment you believe. You know, you are baptized as Christ said, he would baptize us with the Holy Ghost. So in every instance we saw that occurred, they were baptized in water, but only after they believed. You know, so it's not like the Pentecostals will incorrectly teach that baptism is how you receive the Holy Ghost. Uh, and it also does not wash your sin away, which a lot of people will also teach in false religions. But it's the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all sin. You know, so baptism, again, is just a picture, a symbol of that thing. So in 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, verse 20, it says, Which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, when the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. 
So again, it's a baptism of water does not save us, and it doesn't make our flesh clean, but it does give us a good conscience towards God because we're obedient in believing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you know, and we show that openly through water baptism. So partaking in the picture of his death, burial and resurrection, you know, is, is again, the first step of obedience uh, in your walk with God. And we also baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We do not do a oneness baptism or a modalist baptism here. You know, it's not a Jesus-only baptism because we were commanded in Matthew 28. It says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So again, it's a sign, it's a picture, but it's not the thing itself. You know, it symbolizes the cross as you go down into the water. It symbolizes the death and burial of Christ as you're underwater. And it symbolizes both the resurrection of Christ and his glorified body, being reborn, and also you being reborn as a new creature as you ascend out of the water. You know, and this is what Christ says, it's the most important commandment. In Matthew twenty two thirty seven. he says, Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So again, this is the doctrine of Christ. This is what Christ came to teach. You know, these, these two here, on all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And this is the doctrine of Christ, to believe on him and then to do what he says. You know, because he is our God. You know, so the command there is to love one another. And even the fact that there is a son of God, you know, this is covered in Second John as well as many other places, including First uh, John chapter 5. And even many others, like John chapter 1, that covers the Son of God. You know, but the Trinity is foundational, and it's a core doctrine of our faith. You know, it's a doctrine of who Christ is and who God is. So in Second John chapter 1, verse 4, it says, I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received the commandment from the Father. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. And this is the commandment, that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. For many deceivers are entered into the world, who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is the deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If they come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. So again, you don't want to be a partaker of their evil deeds. You know, so when it, like Jehovah's Witness or somebody comes to your door and they're preaching a false gospel, repenting your sins, well, I mean, most of those guys don't bother door knocking anyway, but if you do run into these people, the Bible says don't even bid them God's speed because if you, if you even give them a glass of water, you're partaking in their evil deeds. You don't want to be punished for what they do. You know, and anyone who denies the Son of God or the eternal Sonship of Christ or that teaches that Jesus did not come in the flesh or was not resurrected in the flesh, he is not your brother, but they are antichrist. They are accursed and you should have no company with them. So Matthew chapter 3, let me see if I'll get you to turn there. Matthew chapter 3 verse 5, we'll start out. It says, Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea, and all the region round about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw that many of the Pharisees and Sadducees came to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid under the root of the trees. 
Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So again, these people are coming and they're trusting in their lineage, their genealogy, saying, hey, we're children of Abraham, but these were not people of faith. And that's why he attacks them. He says, you just get out of here, you vipers. You don't belong here. We'll pick up in verse 11. It says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I. His shoe I am not worthy to bear. His shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand. And he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So I just want you to notice in Hebrews 6 where it says doctrines, doctrine of baptism. So there's a plurality there when it comes to baptisms. Uh, we've even seen multiple baptisms in the Word. You've got the baptism of John with water where he was preaching to believe on him that would come after him. The baptism of the Holy Ghost, which Christ gives to everyone that believes. And the baptism of fire, which is reserved for the chaff. This is the unsaved, but specifically the false prophets and the false teachers. So I'll get you to take note of verses uh, 10 and 11 there in Matthew 3. You know, so I've heard many say, um, that when John says that Jesus is coming and will baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire, that, that fire is the power of the Holy Ghost. I've heard that through Pentecostals and a lot of other people. But if you actually read it in context, he goes on to explain what that fire is. You know, and it's pretty clear the, baptize, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is for those of us who believe. And the baptism of fire is for those whose end is to be burned. You know, so for, this is for the chaff. It's not just the unsaved, but specifically the false teachers. So I'll get you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 23. But we've already seen the moment we believe we're immersed or baptized in the Holy Ghost. You know, and after that, we are baptized or immersed in water so we can partake of that picture of the Lord's salvation. You know, but we see the baptism of fire there clearly for those who are not saved. So in Jeremiah 23 verse 28... He says, the prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord? And like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words every one from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, he saith. So it's wicked and it's a sin to say the Lord said when he did not say. You know, when you speak deceitfully for the Lord, as it says in Job, you know, when you prophesy falsely using the words of your own imagination and not the words that God spake. You know, so I have all the words that the Lord spake, the King James Bible. I don't need any more words than that. I have every word I need. But it is damning what he says here about those who blaspheme his name in this way, to say the Lord saith and the Lord didn't say. And these people will put to death for this. You know, the Lord doesn't play around when it comes to people blaspheming his name. He takes it very seriously. You know, and we see these unsaved false prophets, their end is to be burned. You know, the fire is for them. You know, and all unsaved the chaff, unless they get saved by believing on Christ. You know, so we should minister the gospel to them because they're just lost. But we don't minister to the false prophets. We reject them. Um, Hebrews 6 also says that that which beareth thorns and briars is then just to be burned. I believe that's talking also about the chaff. These are the false teachers who were teaching in Hebrews that they had to keep the law and be circumcised or continue in the sacrifices to be saved. You know, they were deceiving them in the book of Hebrews and also in Galatians. I covered in, in one of my last sermons they were deceiving them there as well. They were infiltrating and spying out the liberty of the church to bring them back into bondage. You know, teaching you have to keep the sacrifices and be circumcised, adding works after salvation. And keep, you know, the Bible makes it clear, especially in Galatians, these people are not saved if they believe this. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, it says, Beware of false prophets 
which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. And every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, you should, by their fruits you shall know them. So again, that brings us to other groups. I mean, just recently we've seen these Calvinists calling themselves Reformed Baptists. You know, they're not Baptists at all, other than by name. But they're also teaching works after salvation. They're masquerading as Baptist brethren. You know, they'll try and hide the truth of what they believe by being tricky, they're being tricky and sly with their words. And as I preached before in the last sermon, these are men with guile, using subtlety of speech. You know, and often they'll say, you'll do works after salvation, but it's not your works, it's God's works. But they're not voluntary works, because they say that God gives you the faith to believe and he also gives you the works. That's not voluntary and that's not what the gospel is. You know, that's a false gospel and it's a gospel of works. You know, um, yeah, I just find they're the most sneaky and unhanded people when it comes to finding out what they actually believe because they'll tell you what you want to hear all the time. You know, but I know when it comes to salvation, I believe because I wanted to believe. I put my faith on Jesus Christ, not because God made me, but because I chose to. And if I do good works for God, it's because I chose to. It's not because I have to. Yeah, and as I preached in the last sermon, works are not the evidence of salvation. And um, even then, if you don't have works, and I do have works, you're just as saved as I am if you don't have works. It's just your faith is dead being alone. But you're still saved. And there's even other Baptists, so-called, they teach a false gospel of repent of your sins, by adding works, the Catholics, Protestants and Pentecostals teaching you must be baptised to be saved. You've got the Mormon and the JW cults. They deny Jesus Christ. They deny his resurrection in the flesh and the sonship and the godhood of Christ. Yeah, so these false prophets, they're all chaff, made to be destroyed in the fire. So we don't bear with them, not for one hour. You know, they're in this destruction. We should reject them. Even Elijah, he killed every last prophet of Baal when he went up against them. Does it sound like he was willing to bear with them, to even let them live? You know, now, I'm not promoting violence or anything like that. We don't you know, do that in the New Testament. We don't kill anybody. That's not what we're about. You know, I'm certainly not endorsing that. But can you at least just not bear with them and yoke up with them and listen to them and learn from them? You know, is that too much for, to ask? Because that's exactly what Christ asked of us. We should not bear with them. So the second last doctrine there in Hebrews 6 is eternal judgment, which is befitting for the chaff. You know, this is the fire that they're all to be baptized in. This is the resurrection of the unjust. So I've already gone through the teaching that hell is eternal. I did that in one of my previous sermons. Um, but I'll just give you uh, Revelation 14 and Matthew 25 just to refresh you. It says in Revelation 14, 11, And the smoke of the torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So again, just showing hell is, hell is eternal. It's a uh, smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night from the torment. And Matthew 25, 46 says, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. So again, we see the resurrection of the just and the resurrection of the unjust. So that just brings us to the last doctrine that sermon will cover, which is the resurrection of the dead. And more importantly, that's the resurrection of the just. You know, I'm just going to mention a few verses, because again, that's also been covered uh, quite a few times in our church. Uh, we'll get you to turn to Acts 24. Now, 1 Corinthians 15 speaks a lot on this topic. Um, and I know I've also covered this as well. When Brother uh, Kevin went through the book of Corinthians, he also preached on 1 Corinthians 15. That's all about the resurrection of the body. It's all about what we have to look forward to. So again, if you want to learn about that, I suggest you read, read that for yourself. There's a lot of good stuff in that, uh, in that chapter. Uh, but in Acts 24, Paul's speaking about a previous encounter he had in chapter 23 
uh, with the Sadducees and the Pharisees. He says, But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they call this heresy um, about the resurrection. Uh, he says, I worship I got the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. So Paul believed what was written in the prophets, which is about the resurrection, because they knew about the resurrection. Job preached about the resurrection. Many of the Old Testament saints preached about the resurrection. But uh, it says, yeah, so believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets, and have hope towards God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. So the, the resurrection of the unjust, that's listed at the end of Revelation chapter 20, which again, you can read on your own time if you want to look into that. Um, but our blessed hope is that we're going to be with the Lord when we pass on and we'll rule and reign with him in our new bodies for the millennium. You know, I'm looking forward to that and I'm sure a lot of you are as well. Um, you know, but see, with the chaff, their end is the great white throne judgment, which is at the end of chapter 20 in Revelation, their end is to be burned in eternal fire. i read for you Psalm chapter 1. It says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So as children of God, we should be separated from men such as these who pervert the gospel of Christ. And this is the thing, like we can even see there's a separate judgment there's a judgment for the just and a judgment for the unjust. You know, so when we stand before God, we stand in front of him just because we're justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. We have his righteousness imputed unto us. Our sins have been remitted. So when we're judged, we're not judged according to our works, but we are rewarded according to our works. But then they're judged according to their works and they're all found to be short of the glory of God. So they all get cast into the fire. So there's even a separation of judgment between us and the chaff. In 2 John 1 verse 9, it says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. Galatians 1 7 says, Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. 2 Corinthians 6.14 it says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? And what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. And in Luke 12, 51, it says, Suppose ye that I am come to bring peace on earth? I tell you, nay, but rather division. So there are many times we see that when it speaks of the Jews or it speaks of the people hearing, it says there was division amongst them because of him. You know, so Jesus Christ brought division. You know, he says also, we also hear the same thing said of the apostles. I'll get you to turn to Romans chapter 16. Which also teaches, uh, teaches this same thing. Romans 16 verse 17. It says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offences contrary to the doctrine which we have learned, and avoid them. For they that such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Again, this is about those who are sly and cunning. They'll lie about what they really believe, and they'll bring in false doctrine, they'll bring in heresy, they'll bring in false gospels. You know, these are men with guile. It says, and they'll deceive the hearts of the simple. 
Galatians 2, 4 says, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us under bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So again, these are people who are teaching a works gospel. They're adding works of the law after you've believed, either as evidence or as part of the salvation process. You know, but this is not what the Bible teaches. And we do not yoke up with unbelievers, but especially those who will pervert the simplicity of the gospel of Christ. So we don't mess with the doctrines of Christ or the salvation that we've learned from the apostles, prophets, and from Christ himself. And anyone who does not, who does not have the doctrines of Christ, who does not have the gospel of Christ, let him be accursed and have no fellowship with that man. Galatians 6.14, it says, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy upon the Israel of God. So again, it's peace on them who teach according to the teachings of Christ and the apostles and the prophets. So I'll get you to turn to Ephesians 1, so we'll wrap it up here. But in, Hebrew, uh, in Ephesians 1, we also see the same doctrines as in Hebrews 6. So we'll start in verse 1. Ephesians 1, verse 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So here we see the doctrine. This is the doctrine of the Father and the Son. This is, you know, again, two parts of the Trinity we see here. In verse 4, according as he has chosen us in him, before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted to the beloved. So again, this is the doctrine of separation and holiness, us being separated from the world. Ephesians 1, seven says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. So again, verse 7, that's a remission of sins through Jesus Christ and his blood. So it's by grace through faith and not of works. Ephesians 1.8, when, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in, all, in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So here we see that this is the doctrine of the mystery of God, that salvation would come to the Jews and the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, making us all of one flesh and one nation, breaking that middle wall of partition. So that was a mystery in the Old Testament, but that was revealed in the New Testament. In Ephesians 1.11 says, In whom we also have obtained an inheritance, being pre predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. So again, we see trusting in Christ. That's salvation by faith alone in Christ alone. You know, again, it's crystal clear. Ephesians 1.13, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So again, the Trinity, we've got the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And also speaking of the redemption of, of our bodies, which is the resurrection of the just. So, and if you continue reading through Ephesians 1, you see the commandments of loving your neighbor and also the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is what water baptism pictures. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ our Lord. So I just wanted to encourage you today to know what the doctrine of Christ is, to continue in the doctrine of Christ as we're commanded to, and to reject those who do not bring the doctrine of Christ. So let's pray.